Number two, managing for the master. First quarter, 2023. John Pauline. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We're starting lesson two, God's covenants with us in the managing for the master till he comes quarter. Dr. John Pauline is our moderator, and Neil is going to offer our opening prayer. Our dear kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be together. We thank you for the opportunity to study this lesson. We thank you for you being the God that you are and caring enough for us that we can learn from you, giving us these opportunities. Help us to learn, open our hearts and minds, and help us to be willing to pass the knowledge and information that we gather onto others so that they can learn more about you. These things we ask in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. So we're doing the second in a series on stewardship, the concept of what God invites us to do as part of our dominion over the earth, as part of this assignment to make this earth a better place than it is. And we began the first lesson to talk about the metaphor of family, that the universe is a giant family with God as parent, and explored some of the various implications of that for the value of money and whatnot last time. But this time, the metaphor switches to covenant. And covenant is a term that is known today, but perhaps not as widely used as contract but it basically has to do with agreements between people to govern relationships. One reason to have a formal marriage is that marriage governs the relationship of a couple. Obviously, in a good marriage, you don't really need the contract, but when times are rough, it can be good to know that this is a lifelong commitment and you're going to see it through and it's going to work out. So as we begin with this concept of covenant and then explore a little bit what that might mean for stewardship, for our relationship to managing God's resources, let's begin with number one in the handout with a question, what does the metaphor of covenant tell us about God? Or maybe the better question is, what does the metaphor of covenant tell you about God? When you see God choosing to make covenants with human being, what would that imply? What is God communicating when God does that? Livius? He wants to be in relationship. All right. So covenants govern relationships. And so it indicates that God sees himself as in relationship. Yeah. Iris? I think it raises the question, what is the starting point? And when the starting point is human beings being suspicious whether God is trustworthy, it is God extending a hand, but also opening himself to a predictable relationship where God conveys who he is what he offers, what his intentions are, what human beings can expect of him, and what he is asking them to do. So it offers transparency, security, instead of a capricious God, a predictable God that shows his heart. Well expressed. Thank you. Sherry? I was thinking much the same of what Ira said, but God knows that many of us in this war zone of human life now, have issues of being able to trust someone when a lot of people have been untrustworthy. And for him to reach out and say this is very helpful to us, very reassuring and helps us move forward. But it also helps us mentor that to others because we learn from what we experience from others. And if we learn from the mentoring God gives to us, and how he does relationship, then it helps us, I think, in the way we offer friendship and relationship to others. Thank you. Yes, I see several hands, but I'm thinking it might be helpful to read Deuteronomy 7, 7 to 9. And after doing that, we'll continue with the discussion. Deuteronomy 7 and verses 7 to 9. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. 
the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. All right, I want you to notice something in verse 9. I brought it in just now because I think the previous couple of comments were definitely making a point that is supported here. Notice the piece. In the NIV, I think maybe a little more accurate here, it says keeping his covenant. God keeps his covenant. It's not just an arbitrary rule that he says, you know, do this or else. God subjects himself to his own covenant. And when you think about the universe, the God of the universe is willing to limit himself by a covenant he makes with a batch of human beings in one small corner of this universe. And we know how big the universe is these days. To me, this has been one of the most amazing texts in the Bible, that God cares so much to be understood, to be trusted, that he himself says, here's the covenant, I'm going to keep it. I invite you to keep it with me. That's just mind-boggling to me. Larry. Was there ever a time where there wasn't any kind of a covenant? Or whenever there's two people together, two beings with the capacity to think and to do, is there an implied covenant? Or do you not even need a covenant? So is covenant something that pre-existed before God created us? Or was this something that he had to do after he created us? A couple of responses to that. First of all, the covenants in the Pentateuch, particularly Genesis and Deuteronomy, clearly mirror covenants of the time. Deuteronomy has been widely studied as representing Hittite covenants. The Hittites were people that lived in central Turkey today, the Anatolia area near Ankara. That's where the Hittites were. And Hittites and Israelites had a lot of inner reaction, as we know from the Bible. So the Deuteronomy seems framed on the Hittite covenants. So God was using a model that was already in existence. Genesis, you have the story of Abraham buying a plot of land to bury his wife. The back and forth there, you find multiple attestation in Mesopotamia, the area of ancient Babylon. It's exactly how they go about negotiating a property price. I need to buy this property. Oh, eh, I'll give it to you. I don't want to be bothered. We'll just give it to you. And then the other person, oh, no, 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 and offers an outrageous amount. And then they dicker from there. Abraham ended up paying an outrageous amount because he offered it and it was accepted. (laughs) But that pattern of back and forth is very much there. So one answer to the question is, in a real sense, the biblical covenants are parallel to covenants that were already in existence at the time that they were written down. The other interesting piece The first mention of covenant is in Genesis 9, the flood story. And God says, I will make a covenant with you there. But it uses the same language as Genesis 1. So Genesis 1 has the word you used, Larry, implied covenant. It's the same language as chapter 9, but it doesn't use the word covenant. That word is the one added thing in chapter 9. So covenant is at least implied from the beginning. And the God was using models that human beings were familiar with because the purpose of the covenant was to communicate something about God. All right, Bob? I submit that the term covenant, as we're using it here, is equivalent to contract. And if you get into that, you could have God offering a unilateral contract or an option where God says, I will commit myself, you just need to accept it. I'd say in some ways, our current plan of salvation we've discussed is where God has an open offering to everybody to accept his covenant. Not everybody has to accept. You can make another argument that at Mount Sinai, a bilateral contract was being offered, and it got actually materially breached by the Israelites as Moses was, as a representative, accepting it. I'm sounding a little bit like a lawyer here, but I'm trying to define what covenant is, and I think it's a contract. And I think what we've ended up with is where the heirs or the heirs of Israel, because I think at the cross, the covenant moved beyond Israel or Judah and opened up to all of us. Although you could argue in the Old Testament that the covenant was already open to everybody because people like Nebuchadnezzar could accept it. So God already was trying to reach the whole world. But I think we're talking about a contract. Mm -hmm. Well, I was sitting here kind of marveling that you're using the exact language the lesson author used, and it triggered my mind that, you know, I know this fellow, and he is a lawyer. (laughs) So this Sabbath school lesson was written by a lawyer, and he uses those terms, bilateral and unilateral, to talk about two different types of covenants in the Bible. 
Good. Uh, we'll come back to that. Robert. When you said the word covenant, the first thing that came to my mind is God is totally trustworthy and yet every covenant he's made, he's never broken them. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael. Yeah. Following up on what Bob had to say about a written contract, it's not unusual today to see particularly lengthy contracts with a number of sub paragraphs and they're enumerated as separate covenants, which are part of the overall contract itself. And the other thing I wanted to mention was the earliest writings of which we are aware in cuneiform, which is for clay tablets, were really accounting records. And it's believed that that's one of the reasons for the development of written language. If I'm going to loan you a hundred bushels of wheat today, when the harvest comes in six or seven months from the day, you're going to pay me back 105 bushels. Well, you'd want some sort of a record to establish that rather than having an argument later. And there were ziggurat that they found in Ur, and they found also all kinds of other buildings. One of the buildings they opened was filled with all these clay tablets, and they were all accounting records. That's all they were. Yeah. Ancient temples were actually places where business was done, where trade took place. So they were multiple-use temples in the ancient world. You'll be interested to know that in some parts of the Near East, peoples relied on memory. And you know the idea of the elders at the gate. Transactions would occur in front of the elders at the gate, and it was assumed that the transaction didn't have to be written down because if there was ever a dispute, they'd go back to the elders and they would say, no, this is what you agreed, and this is how it's going to go down. So the written records went way, way back, but some relied for their financial accounts on memory as well. Aaron. Yeah. Somebody asked about, is this a covenant that's always been or something that came along the way? And as far as maybe the way God exactly describes it to different people is different, but the core, I believe, has always been. In Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so in Revelation 14, it says the angel has the everlasting gospel. It's the gospel that's always been and always will be. And in Colossians 1, it talks about the mystery hid from ages and from generations, but it's now revealed. So the who God is at his core is the way he's always been, the way he always will be, and it's the good news. An interesting sidelight to what you said. And yes, I think in a way, God, of course, precedes covenants. Covenants are a way that God is communicating his reliability, providing security for us, etc. But there's an interesting interplay in the Old Testament between the concept of covenant and the concept of promise. God covenants with Abraham, but he also frames it at times in terms of promise. Here's what I'm going to do. And sometimes those promises are unilateral. This is what I'm going to do. Sometimes they're bilateral. They're conditional. I'll do this if. But the line between promise and covenant is quite thin in many places of the Old Testament. Henry. The way that I see this is there are Two types of covenants that sometimes we do. Some of them are implicit. We don't even say it, but we have a covenant. And in some cases, the covenant is to show commitment, something that I will do, not as a promise. I am committed to something. I am making a covenant. And it is with yourself and whoever you are planning to impact with that covenant. Let's say I become a parent. I don't have to sign any document. I don't have to tell my wife. I don't have to tell my son that I'm going to make a covenant to protect that child. It's my covenant. And I am committed to that no matter what. That's a covenant, right? I don't have to make it legal, but it's a covenant. Mm -hmm. And the other covenant we do is to gain trust. Yeah, isn't that the border between promise and covenant? The covenant may be the more legal written thing, but the promise is taken very seriously. If it's right. said and, it, and, and it is not just a promise, it's my commitment, right? It's a covenant I'm making whenever that child is born or even before to care, to protect, to do everything that is good for that child. And the other type of covenant I can make is to gain trust. Mm -hmm. If two parties are not in a relationship of trust, then I say, well, let me sign this so I can tell you that I will commit to what you cannot believe I will do unless I sign it. So based on that, I think that God has an everlasting covenant 
with all of his creatures. Mm -hmm. From the very beginning of creation, he committed himself to care for his creation. Upon heaven, before earth was made, he made a covenant for those creatures. And it happened that those children, some of them went astray. And he kept his covenant of caring for them, regardless of what was going on. And he started acting on that. Some of the parties on that covenant didn't believe him. But I am sure that in heaven, he said, I'm going to resolve this problem that is devastating my family. We just don't know because that covenant doesn't relate to us. We were not in place. So he doesn't have to put it on the Bible. But I am sure he committed himself to the heavenly creatures to resolve the issue. The issue expanded up to earth, and then now he needs to share that covenant that he has everlasting now with his children, and he expresses that covenant in a different way, uh, different words to Adam and Eve. This problem that has just come up, I am committing myself to resolve it, and it doesn't depend on you. This, your seed is going to crush the head of the serpent. This is my covenant. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to be good. You don't have to believe it. I'm going to do it because this is my everlasting covenant to take care of my children and resolve it. And then we see all of the variations of God needed to come up with down payments and some monthly payments in order to increase our level of confidence in him that he will take care of the problem of sin and rebellion in the universe. And that is his everlasting covenant. So Henry points out a couple of places where there are unilateral covenants where God simply says, I'm committed to do this, and it doesn't matter what you do. If you look in the handout, number one, there are three such examples there as well. Matthew 5, 45. Well, we won't take time to read those, but that's basically saying the Lord brings rain on the just and on the unjust equally. The response of people is irrelevant. God brings the resources that people need to survive to all equally. In Genesis 8.22, it says that God commits that the seasons will no longer shift around, that they will be stable, that summer and winter and so on will all come with stability. Those seasons are not dependent on human response to God. And then chapter 9, the rainbow, God guarantees that he will do certain things for this world regardless. So there are unilateral covenants, covenants where God simply says, this is what I do, what I will do, and I'm going to write it down and commit myself to it so that you can have confidence in what I'm going to do and how I feel about you. So the concept of covenant is central to our study today. And in number two, the author moves from this idea of unilateral covenants to bilateral covenants, and he includes the salvation covenant among the bilateral covenants. So according to the lesson, the salvation covenant is an example of a bilateral covenant that is conditional upon the responses of the parties named in the covenant. And it suggests looking at a couple of texts. So let's read 1 John 5 and verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. All right, so this letter is written so that the readers might know that they have eternal life. And then the question is, what kind of human response is called for in order to have this assurance of eternal life? And I think you can go back to the first chapter to find the answer to that in John, 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All right. So God's part is to provide assurance of eternal life. What is the human side of this bilateral covenant? And the answer here is to confess and then trust God's response. If we confess our sins, we know that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So the one thing asked of human beings here is confession, is to be truly sensitive to the damage that one has done with sin. And those who so confess will find God's response to be complete for them. The story is told 
about a woman who came to the pastor and said, I sinned years and years and years ago, and I've asked God many times, but I still don't feel forgiven. And so the pastor said, okay, are you willing to confess that sin? Oh, yes. Well, let's pray. And you confess that sin to God. And so she prayed and did so. And when she got up, she says, I still don't feel forgiven. And so the pastor pulled out this text and said, you just called God a liar. Because God said, if you confess your sins, he will forgive. He's faithful. He's just. And somehow that actually helped. (laughs) Sort of a risky tack. But the lady saw the point that her lack of feeling connected to God was not on God's part. It was on her unwillingness to trust God's word, that what he said he will do, he will do. So here you see the response that God is looking for to be a response of confession. Larry? I was reading Matthew, the story of the two blind individuals who came to Christ. And Christ asked them, do you trust that I can do this? Which was an interesting way to start off the conversation. And they replied, yes. And then this really hit home. It says, as you have believed, let it be done. Meaning as I understand it at this point, if you're 30% there, that's what you're going to get is 30%. And you bring up the faith and the trust and how our faith and trust limits what we get. It doesn't limit what God can give, but it limits the amount of his giving that we can experience and understand. And that story just reminded me of that, that there is a lot of this that is conditional upon our ability to process trust and faith in those items. So, And it's conditional not because God needs us to be conditional, but it's conditional because God wants us to be fully engaged in the relationship. And that's what he's really asking for. And if we're not fully engaged, then what should we expect in return? And the second point on this was with the thing of forgiveness. If, in fact, forgiveness was established at the foundation of the universe, pre-creation, pre-Lucifer's fall, wherever you want to take the foundation to begin with, it wasn't God's intention then to ever hold any of this against us. So... Our purpose of looking for forgiveness is our problem, not God's problem. So God isn't saying, yeah, you do have to confess because that's part of the cleansing process. But the confession doesn't trigger anything in God because he already did that. It's like, no, 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 Larry, you don't understand. I never intended to hold this against you. So for me, the struggle has been accepting even that understanding, and then finally getting to the point where it made some sense, because I struggled kind of like this lady the pastor was counseling with. All right. I think John 6.29 may come close to what you just shared. So let's hear that one. John chapter 6 and verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in whom he has sent. All right. Here's an interesting factoid. In Paul, faith is always a noun. In John, faith is always a verb. What do you make of that? And we're not talking two or three examples in each case. Paul, faith, I think, is at least something like 80. And in John, believe is at least 100. So this is a very consistent way that these two writers think. What's the difference between faith and believing? Larry's going to give it a try. Good for you. I can see that it is an object. And therefore, as an object, it can have its personalities or can be a describable, but it's also a process. And I think you could say the same thing for love. You can describe love, but it is something you also do. And it is something that progresses and develops. So if faith, like love, progresses and develops, it, the object, takes on an activity of being, of doing. Okay. You're definitely groping at the edges of something here. Let's see if we can work together to clarify some more. Neil? In the Greek, isn't it the same? It's the same root word. It's pistos. But but a noun and a verb are not the same in the Greek. And in English, you notice the difference that the noun is always faith and the verb is always believe. 
And Adventists, I think, have tended to be a little skeptical of the word believe. You know, well, believe, you just, you know, you, you have an idea in your head and you think that's good enough to save you or something. But what do you think? Why would John so consistently not use the noun and use the verb instead? The mission of God is that you might believe. Bob? Well, each of us has our own way of writing. You can often tell a writer by their style. So my question is, is it just the habit of the way that particular person wrote? In my mind, there really isn't a great deal of difference. And I may be falling into a trap here, but it seems to me they're the same. Okay. Add another little dimension to it. Faith is a point in time. Believe, whenever it's in the present tense in the Greek, is an ongoing thing. So you can talk about in the past, you know, you have believed and thinking about that point in time when you started believing. But using the verb, there's the sense that this is ongoing, that believing is a process. I think that's a helpful term to use. Whereas faith can be more of a point in time. I trust you today, but after what you just did, I don't trust you anymore. John seems to want to say that the key for human response is not the occasional spot of commitment to God or not. It's coming to the place where there is continual trust, where we're in a relationship of genuine trust. It may have some ups and downs, but it's continuous, is I think the word that expresses the Greek most strongly there. Believing is a continuous thing, whereas faith can be a point in time. Henry. Thank you. The way that I make the distinction between these two, the noun and the verb, it is that I can believe, but if that doesn't make me act on what I believe, it didn't make any change. Like the demons believe that there is God, but that doesn't make any difference on them. Okay, It's just like Abraham in the chapter 15 of Genesis. He believed in God and it was accounted to him for justice, but he still didn't believe that he was going to have a son, right? He still started to use a lot of tricks because the belief was not enough. The trust came later on, on the process of God showing him that believing was not enough, that now he needed to act according to the belief. And this is, for me, the difference why John uses this as a verb, because it becomes a verb when I start acting on it. Verb are actions, are not only the scriptures. And this is how I make this difference. I think that's very helpful. It will be of interest to you to know that faith in Paul and in James is not the same thing. For James, faith is, how should we put it, a mental assent is the way I usually express it. Faith is a mental ascent. It's something you tick off in your mind. But until that's combined with action, it's not complete and it won't save anyone. So faith is simply mental ascent that needs to be enhanced by works in order to become genuine. So it was not till Abraham's mental ascent was affirmed by his willingness to sacrifice Isaac that his faith became complete. Paul, on the other hand, Faith is everything. It's the whole ball of wax. It's a whole person concept. So Paul can't conceive of the idea of a mental ascent. Faith is everything you've got. And sometimes that's been illustrated, for better or for worse, by the tightrope walker who walked a wheelbarrow across the Niagara Falls, you know, on a tightrope, and then asked the crowd the question, how many of you think I could run a person across that cable? And every hand went up. Then he said, who will be first? And every hand came down. You know, so that illustrates a bit the difference between mental assent. You can believe that something is true, but you don't believe it enough. You don't trust it enough to act upon it. So, Henry, I think that was a helpful distinction that you can see between Paul and James as well. Let's go to number three. And number three, it says Deuteronomy is the written version of Moses' farewell speeches to the second generation of Israelites after the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. All right, so Moses, as they're approaching the promised land, is going to give them a series of messages to prepare them for what is coming. You get the sense, maybe from the order at least, that this might be after Moses was told by God that he was not going to actually take them in. And so knowing that Moses does everything he can to prepare them to go in without him, they won't have his leadership. They won't have his support. They won't have his encouragement. They're going to have to do this on their own. 
but he does everything he can to prepare them for that eventuality. And Deuteronomy is the place where these things are written down. So let's go to Deuteronomy 28, where you see the fundamental covenant that God makes. And let's start with verse 1. If you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All right, so who is God speaking to here? It may seem like an odd question, but it's a really important one. Who is being called to obey here? The people who God had just delivered. Okay, I think you're absolutely right. But which people? The ones that had been given the covenant passed down from Abraham. Yes, I was deliberately vague. So let's keep groping here. Iris. It's actually the next generation of those who witnessed the Exodus. Their parents had perished in the wilderness. And these are now the descendants of those who left Egypt and to whom Moses speaks these words. Okay, I can see I was probably too vague, but I think you're both right in what you're saying. But here's the point that I think is really, really critical. We tend to read Deuteronomy 28 as if it were written to me. We tend to read Deuteronomy 28 as if God was speaking to individual Israelites. But you'll notice from the language of 28.1, he says, I will put you above all the other nations. Who is he speaking to? Israel as a nation. He's not speaking to Israel as individuals. Because if you take Deuteronomy and apply it to individuals, you have a problem, right? If you do these things, you'll be on top of the world. Is that necessarily so individually? As a nation, I could see that. You see, that if Israel as a nation is faithful to God, the natural course of events will gradually lift them up above everybody else. There's too much injustice in the world for individual faithfulness to necessarily be rewarded in this life. So I think it's very important to realize Deuteronomy 28 is written to the nation of Israel. It's a promise to the nation of Israel, not a do or don't for the average person. Daniel. And because of our individualistic society, we tend to read it as it is written to me individually. But as you said, it's written to a community, and then there will be the wisdom literature that will individualize the covenant and show in the example of Job and in the example of people in the book of Proverbs, etc., that it does not work like that on an individual level. And people often go through a big disappointment, especially if they refuse to move beyond stage one of their development that, Lord, I did all this and you did not follow up on your part of the covenant. And so this transactional understanding of who God is and what he wants is a big misunderstanding of the Bible. And it's because with our glasses, uh, we read individualized covenant into where the corporate covenant is there. Mm. Yes, very much to the point. And I think it's one of the reasons why many people think the Old Testament is legalistic, because they read Deuteronomy straightforward and say, if you do this and if you do that, all this good stuff's going to happen. The transaction, as Daniel put it. But that's not exactly what's going on here. This is God's covenant with the nation. And uh, at that level, of course, if obedience, all other things being equal, leads to prosperity, well, you get a million people obeying, and the chances are good that most of them will be prosperous. This life is unfair enough that it won't work for everybody. But for a nation, if a whole nation is obedient, the possibilities are considerable for that nation's prosperity and growth. Yeah. Larry? What I found really interesting in the first part of the Deuteronomy it's talking about the blessings will come upon you and they're going to settle on you. And in various versions, it gives different implications, but like you're going to be covered. It's like the fog envelops you. You can't get away from it. Or like the sunshine, you go outside on a beautiful spring day and there's sunshine outside. So it's there around you all the time. All right, let's read Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 14. I think it would be good just to read it through as a group. If you will only obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments that I am commanding you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. 
Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your livestock, both the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you in one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you undertake. He will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as his holy people as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open for you his rich storehouse, the heavens, to give the rain of your land in its season, and to bless all your undertakings. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be only at the top and not at the bottom. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today by diligently observing them, and if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I am commanding you today, either to the right or to the left, following other gods to serve them. All right. So here you see a series of promises based on Israel's responses, like a bilateral covenant. But notice it says there'll be enhanced production, land, crops, animals, etc. Most business back in those days was agriculture because that was the key thing. It took the vast majority of people working night and day to provide enough food for the whole country. So the number one industry was agriculture, and God promises to make that blessed in a large way. They'd be protected when they travel. They'd have victory in battle. They'd have prosperity in their land. They would have a special relationship with God, who's the great giver. There would be impact on the other nations. They would be impressed with Israel and afraid of them. And then repeat some of the earlier things on production and so on. Verse 12, they would be lenders rather than borrowers. Coming back to the previous lesson, okay, what is a lender? It's someone who has stored up life in surplus and can share with others, can lend to others. What is a borrower? It's somebody who's borrowing life from the future. They're mortgaging, you could say, their own future in order to have more of whatever they want to have today. So God promises them they'll be prosperous. You'll be lenders and not borrowers in this world. And it says you'll be the head, not the tail politically. It's not promising that everyone who's faithful to God will end up president. Okay, that's never happened and it isn't going to happen in this world. But what he's saying is Israel as a nation would be politically powerful. They would determine their own destiny. Small countries in the ancient world had no control over their destiny because at any point, some much bigger power could just sweep across and, and devastate everything. But Israel was to be powerful enough that they could settle their own destiny with anybody. And this was rarely the case in Israel's actual history. So here you see God promising them as a nation certain things that would happen. And if you look at history, not everyone will be excited by this, but it's been noted that the most successful countries in all of history have tended to be, more recently at least, have tended to be countries with a Protestant background. And that is perhaps because it was in Calvinism, particularly Calvin's Geneva, that the economic principles of the Bible were most elaborately put into play. And that Calvinistic background moved to New England and uh, also moved to Old England. And you've heard of the Puritans, for example, those were Calvinists. They settled New England. And so you have that influence, the Calvinistic influence, wherever that was central. Germany, Holland, Scandinavia, England, United States, Australia, those have become, even if they're secular today, these principles, I think, do work in the larger scheme of things. 
So, like I said, not everybody would be thrilled with that analysis. But if you simply go through the world and look, you know, what was the primary spiritual influence in a particular country? The tendency is if they had a particularly Calvinistic background or Protestant background, they would tend to be more successful than their neighbors. Just an interesting observation that the degree to which one takes some of these things seriously may still be powerful among the nations, again, not an individualistic. Going the other direction, Deuteronomy 28 will read just 15 to 19. But if you will not obey the Lord your God by diligently observing all his commandments and decrees, which I am commanding you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your ground, the increase of your cattle, and the issue of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. So the language here is reversing the earlier part. Those, if a nation that does not obey will have the opposite. In other words, God will no longer be able to protect them. And so you have this powerful sense of a choice that a nation has to go with God or go in another direction. We won't read verses 20 to 68, but among the curses of the covenant are disease, contagious disease, climate issues, defeat in battle, psychological confusion, slavery, hunger, poverty, exile. So those are some of the consequences. Yeah, Bob? So we have to reconcile that with Job and some of the other stories, because Job was doing what was right, and he didn't fit in with that. I know sometimes that that would be the basis for saying, well, if someone is not doing well, like one of the disciples said to Christ, so what did this person do or their ancestor do that caused them to be ill? So how do you balance that? I think the big picture, like you said earlier, is it doesn't always work for the individual, but it does seem to play out of Judeo-Christian philosophy, where if you're doing what's right, you'll be prosperous, and those who are not prosperous must have done something wrong or their ancestors did. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Bob, and gives me a chance to underline what Daniel said. The danger here is individualizing. This is talking about nations here in Deuteronomy 28. In Proverbs, the same language is used individually, but it's interesting how the Bible counterbalances that with the book of Job, you see. Proverbs and Job are in the central part of Scripture, so-called writings, and they are deliberately counter each other. Proverbs says, if you do right, you'll be rich. If you do wrong, you'll be in poverty. Well, that doesn't really work. And Job comes right out and says, that didn't work in my case whatsoever. I like to put it this way, and that is, in Proverbs is absolutely true, all other things being equal. All other things being equal if you're faithful, you'll be prosperous. All other things being equal, if you're unfaithful, it will tend to run you downhill. Things are not equal in this life. And therefore, in any individual case, this may not work at all. And if we expect it to, because it's in the Bible and written in an absolute way, we may get very discouraged in a hurry. While we're on this, though, And for Michael's sake, let me just share this. There's one country that's a puzzle in all of this, and that's Bavaria. Bavaria is a large province in the southern part of Germany, which, contrary to most of the rest of the country, is deeply entrenched Catholicism. And frankly, in my view, Bavaria is probably the most beautiful territory on earth, the most well-kept, the most beautifully placed. And I'd love to know some of the background there. How did that happen? You compare with Italy and say, well, you know, same culture, but how did it turn out so different? It'd be interesting to study further. But generally speaking, the more Protestant, the more Calvinist the country, the more likely it is to be economically successful in today's world. All right. So I think we've covered those bases and it's Michael's chance to come back with a correction, rebuttal, clarification. No, no, that's no, you're whatever's needed. <laughs> you're absolutely correct. One of the conundrums, Adolf Hitler was from Bavaria. That's he right. He was raised a Catholic. That's right. And the comment I was going to make was, over the many, many centuries since the time of Christ, Jewish people have been associated with being lenders, particularly of money. And one of the reasons for that is it was improper for a Jew to charge interest to another Jew, Mm -hmm. but not to a Gentile. And I can't remember which one of the Rothschilds it was who said he wasn't sure what the seven wonders of the world were. But he knew what the eighth one was, compound interest. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that.
Yes. All right. Let's go on to number four. And here we're going to read Proverbs 3.10. You know, speaking of Proverbs, let's go there and look it right in the face. And we're going to go to Proverbs 3, 1 to 10. And here it's individualized. All right. So this is Deuteronomy, but on an individual basis. And let's see how you think that plays. And what I'd like you to do, Terry, is to read two verses at a time. So verses one and two, and then three and four, because they are pairs, poetic pairs that work together. So Proverbs three, beginning with one and two. My child, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and abundant welfare they will give you. So if you keep God's commandments, you'll have long life and you'll have peace. Three and four. Do not let loyalty and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and of people. All right. So if you value God's principles of steadfast love and faithfulness, you will have favor with God and with other human beings. In other words, everybody's going to like you and everybody's going to have a positive opinion of you. All right. Verses five and six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. All right. So if you have a wholehearted trust in God, then you're going to work only straight paths, no mountains to climb, you know, no winding brooks, no wading through rushing rivers, nice, straight, easy travel is going to be yours. Verses seven and eight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing for your flesh and a refreshment for your body. So humility, honoring God, avoiding evil results in physical health. You'll be healthier physically. Verses nine and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. So if you honor the Lord, you will be wealthy. Now, I've always treated these passages with that proviso, all other things being equal. It seems to me is kind of critical. Does every person you know that keeps God's commandments have a long life? Does every person you know that follows God have a peaceful life? Does every person you know that follows God have a high reputation with everybody inside and outside the church? Does every follower of God you know have an easy, straight path for their life? Does every godly person you know have physical health? Is every godly person you know amazingly wealthy? And I think the obvious answers to those questions are no. And so I've explained this with all other things being equal. These principles will have positive consequences and neglecting them will have negative consequences. But life is far too unequal for this to simply be a, you know, quid pro quo, do this and that will happen. And some Christian preachers, I think, make that mistake, the so-called prosperity gospel. You do this, 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 and this, and you're guaranteed to be wealthy. And if you're not, there's something wrong with you. Larry. That points up the dilemma of basically even free salvation. It's free, but it's not. All that you're saved by faith. Well, not really. You have to actually have faith in the right thing, but then you also have to do things. So everything that we discuss, there's the tension between the simple statement and how it really has to get resolved and dealt with. If you do the right thing for the right reason, the positive result to me is an inner peace that you can't take away from me no matter what you do to me. Thank you. Michael? You know, there was a book written several years ago, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Because they do. And it's easy to fall into a trap is, why is this happening to me? Why am I being, what have I done that I'm being punished for? In other words, this is some sort of temporal punishment for something. And oftentimes I can't even think of what it is. And it has nothing to do with being punished. It just has to do with the circumstances of life. You know, you hear these stories about the guy that walks into a store and buys a six pack of Coca-Cola and you got a change. I owe you a dollar. He says, oh, I'll take one of those lottery tickets and then wins $750 million or something. What does that happen to that guy? Not me. Because it does. That's why. And it's no more complicated than that. And I think we all tend to internalize these kinds of things for the wrong reasons. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Really appreciate that. Bob. 
the last verse that was read a minute ago, someone's going to maybe ask a question because it actually, when you were reading it, it talked about your vats will be bursting with wine. Did it literally mean wine or is that a metaphor for grape juice? Was it okay for Israelites to drink wine? Someone's going to ask it. And- well, both Hebrew and Greek, the word for wine is ambiguous. It can mean grape juice and it can mean the other kind as well. So to take the Bible and say, It is absolutely against alcohol in any form at any time. Probably is not accurate. I I had a good friend, Sam Bakioki, who wrote Wine in the Bible, and it was very well researched, very well written, etc. But I came away just a little less than convinced entirely. I don't touch the stuff, never have, never will. So that's not what this is about. I'm simply saying, looking at the evidence, one thing you have to keep in mind is they didn't have public health. They didn't have people constantly examining the water for microbes and stuff like that. It was dangerous to drink water that was seeping out of a mountainside. You never knew where that water had been. And sanitation was very poor back then in many places. So a little bit of wine, you know, added into the water was a safeguard. Remember, Paul says to Timothy, you're having constant stomach problems. Why don't you add a little wine for your stomach's sake? Alcohol was a medicinal factor in that it could kill some of the germs that would otherwise create disease. So in that context, to expect God to offer a teetotaling message maybe is more than we should expect. Interestingly enough, though, speaking as a Seventh-day Adventist, Ellen White's most comprehensive treatise on the subject is a chapter in one of the testimonies. And it's around the middle somewhere. I think it's volume four, maybe. But somewhere in there, there's a chapter called On the Manufacture of Beer and Cider. Not a promising title, I suspect. But there she articulates her view on alcohol. And she doesn't use a Bible text. She uses logical arguments, such as no one knows who the alcoholic is. You would be wise not to find out. You know, to even start drinking, you know, moderate drinking is not good because moderate drinkers end up drunkards and nobody knows who the alcoholic is when you start. Another argument she makes is every drink destroys brain cells. I don't know about you, but I don't have too many to lose. So that's not a good start either. And then she talks about influence. If you're elder of the church and you drink moderately and it doesn't bother you a bit, but some member follows your example and ends up in the gutter, that's on you. So she's arguing scientifically, philosophically, and I think that argument is pretty airtight. Alcohol has never really been much of a blessing, except maybe as an antiseptic from time to time. So to look to the Bible for that slam dunk text that forbids even social drinking, I don't think you'll find it there. But there are good psychological, sociological, philosophical reasons to take that position, and I'm not ashamed to take such a position. All right, let's go to number five, and we'll draw toward a conclusion here. And this, of course, is the text that everyone expected would be at the heart of a series of lessons on stewardship, an Adventist entity. And putting God first is the topic here. Malachi 3, verses 7 to 11. Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will anyone rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how are we robbing you? In your tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house, and thus put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you an overflowing blessing. I will rebuke the locust for you so that it will not destroy the produce of your soil and your vine in the field shall not be barren, says the Lord of hosts. Interesting point in verse 11. God's blessing is defined as rebuking the devourer. In other words, God's blessing isn't necessarily God intervening to cause a bunch of stuff, but rather saying that when you put God first in your life, it frees him in a free universe to rebuke the devourers, to undo the curse that Satan would love to put upon you, to get in the way of Satan's ambitions for you. And so what tithe as a part of a total whole 
person commitment to God brings God close and prevents Satan from doing some of the things to you that he would freely love to do. So here you have a group of people that were ignoring God's directions. And they say, how are we ignoring your directions? And God says, well, I'll give you an example, tithes and offerings. You are robbing me. And when you rob me, you lose my protection. I would love to protect you. I'd love to enhance you. And as one preacher once said, he says, 90% with God on your side is probably way better than 100% without. And that's kind of what the text is pointing us to here, that to have God near and to have God's blessing, it's arguing what is the sacrifice of returning ties to God if in the end you end up in a better place? Anyway, Iris. There is a little bit also the danger to see this very contractual, kind of like I can't afford without the blessing of God. I would like to suggest we are giving a fraction of the many blessings that God gives to us. And I think it's an act of worship when we do that. It is making a profound statement. God, you are important to me. You are the one who actually gives all of this with such generosity. And when I stop giving God that which he would like for me to give to him, to reserve to him. I'm also making a statement. God, you're not really relevant. I deserve because I worked for this. (laughs) This is mine. And it's really then also self-taking over. You pointed out the enemy. But I think when we are not anchored in worshiping God, we worship something else. We start worshiping idols. And I think that worship, even of money itself, is what does us in eventually. And so I see also an inherent blessing. And as we are anchored in expressing through the tithe that God is the giver of everything that we have, we are anchoring ourselves in that which is healthy, rather being prey to self, to idols, to things that have the potential to do us in. Yes, very helpful. Thank you. And I was just thinking as you were speaking that what Malachi is saying here reminds me of the three types of obedience that you'll find in the 12th conversation about God that Maxwell and Venden did many years ago. The idea that some people obey because they fear punishment or desire reward. Other people obey because they want to please God. And that's a step forward. But the ideal obedience is one where you embrace God's ways as your own best life and you make it your own. I think that's what Malachi is saying. The language of robbery probably makes it sound almost like this contractual type of a thing. But what I think Malachi is really trying to say is, look, God doesn't ask for this to be a hardship to you. He asks for it because he wants to invite you into a deeper and more fulfilling relationship, which will include, most likely, more prosperity than you had dreamed of. That's the kind of life you would want to embrace if you fully understood it. And I think Malachi is appealing to them, look, look at this through God's eyes, and you will see it's the only way to live. And one thing I found through the years is if you put that first, if you make a budget and you put God first in your budget— that everything else works out. After a while, you don't even miss it. And so it's an amazing thing that when we make God part of our lives, he stretches everything else in a way that is amazing. Henry. I also would like to convey the idea that we should be careful with the formula because I don't think that this section of Malachi is actually talking about the elements of you are not tithing. This is probably addressing the real issue that the people is having at that time. They think they are on God's side. And God is trying to tell them, no, you are not. Because that's not the only thing that God tells them. If we continue reading in the same chapter, just going on verse 13, then God tells them, you have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? So I think God is addressing a more internal issue than just the tithing element, that They are faking it. They think they are with God, but they are not. Because the problem is not just the giving of the tithe. When Jesus came, some 300 years after, I don't know exactly how long, they were tithing even the mint, right? They were giving everything, and it didn't help that way. So that's not what God is asking. I don't think it's the transactional thing that we're seeing in here, because 
Jesus even said, they will always be poor among you. And it's not because they don't die. It's because of the way that the world works. And there was a, that exemplar lady that was a poor woman. She was not even given that. She was given everything. And she was poor. And the disciples were with Jesus and they needed to pay their taxes. And they didn't even have money for that. That Jesus needed to make a miracle to get a fish to get that money out. So I think that we need to be also careful. And we sometimes emphasize this section of the Bible in order to say, well, this is why we tithe, because God cannot bless you. I don't say that we shouldn't be doing it. I'm just saying that we should be careful on the application that stewardship relies on this section of the Bible. I think you're absolutely right, Henry, that the issue in Malachi 3 was not the tithe. The tithe was the illustration that God shows. It was the example that God gave. That doesn't mean it can't be useful for us in assessing a stewardship and tithing, etc., but it is easy to overuse it for that person. But since we are working with lessons that were provided for us, we do want to pay attention to the points that they were trying to make. But I think you're rightly cautioning us that if we take a truly exegetical read of Malachi 3, the root issue is not the tithe, it is the surface issue that illustrates the problem that they are having. All right, so appreciate very much what you've all been sharing, and we see that we're coming together here to see that the ultimate issue behind all these things is what kind of God we serve, and is God an exacting taskmaster that demands 10%, or is one seeing this as part of a larger relationship? I think it's a very critical perspective. All right, Michael, and we're getting into the last words here, so we'll look forward to that. I thought of the words of Mother Teresa at one time said, I know that God will not give me more than I can handle, but why does he keep testing me? <laughs> yes. Well, we'll be taking a look at issues like these from a number of angles this quarter. And I'd like to close with the concept that covenant at its heart is one of the ways that God communicates his character to us, his generosity, his kindness, his consistency his desire that we have security and trust. And in these things, we can rejoice. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the covenant. Thank you for the commitments that you have made. It makes a huge difference in our lives to know you like that. And I pray that you would help us to so live and so speak that others might see you the same way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.